name is Dennis Daly and I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. Uh, today we have the great pleasure of interviewing Mr. Vernon Corbin at the Main Library. It is December 14th, 2006 and our camera operator today is Ms. Yvonne Franklin. Mr. Corbin, thank you very much for agreeing to do the interview with us today. And um, I'd like to start off uh, with you maybe giving us a little background about yourself before the war and how you came to be uh, in the Army. Were you enlisted? Were you drafted? Uh, just a little bit of background. Well, I was um, born and brought up in a small town in Missouri, Higginsville, Missouri, close to uh, Kansas City. And on uh, Pearl Harbor Day, my father had taken delivery of a brand new uh, Buick Special four-barrel carburetor, first automobile we'd ever owned that had a radio in it. And so we decided to give it a try, and we headed out after lunch toward uh, Independence, Missouri, where my aunts lived. And uh, along the way, we heard for the first time about the uh, activities in Pearl Harbor. Well, the interesting thing is my aunts lived right across the street from Harry Truman, and so it was kind of an interesting experience to think that uh, on Pearl Harbor Day, I was right across the street from uh, Harry Truman. Uh, was Mr. Truman still in uh, Missouri at this time? Because he oh, yes. was not the vice president at that, at that No, I think he was still a senator mm -hmm. then. But he, but he was in town? That's I think he was, was yes, as I recall. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Well, at any rate, uh, I was a uh, senior in college, and the war seemed a long ways off, and uh, we all figured that it would be over before uh, much of anything going to happen. And I uh, started off to uh, college at the University of Cincinnati. And um, about that time they lowered the draft age to 18 and so I was uh, a candidate. And um, the university was telling everyone that it was important to join a reserve or we were going to be promptly drafted and the reserve programs uh, offered a delay and the possibility of continuing your college. So I, after much uh, arguing with my parents, got permission to join the Navy Air Corps. <clears throat> so, with a bunch of the guys from the fraternity, we went downtown here someplace uh, to enlist. And about the first thing they showed were these colorblind charts with little dots. I didn't even get my coat off before I was rejected. Well, the guy said, you know, the Army Air Corps is not quite as um, strict about these things, so I went down and tried that. At least there they had the, the uh, written exam first, which I passed. <clears throat> but after carefully examining me, uh, he concluded I was colorblind, which I didn't know. At any rate, I thought, well, I'll wait it out. And uh, since my draft board was back in Missouri, when my name came up, I was able to delay it until I finished my freshman year at, at the university. And uh, came home and uh, did my normal summer job as a lifeguard at a local swimming pool. And shortly my name came up and I was drafted and went off to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas where I was uh, inducted. <clears throat> this time when we did the physical exam and we were doing the colorblind charts, the fellow right back to me was whispering what they were, so I passed. And they put me into, uh, I'd been in ROTC in the uh, Coast Artillery and uh, thought that that would be you know, worthwhile for the Army because I'd had some experience. But uh, they decided instead to put me in the Army uh, Air Corps Engineers. I had a quick question before we go on here. Um, at the tail end of the Vietnam War, they went to a lottery for the draft. How, how did the draft work during World War II? Was it, was it just sort of a, a, I know you had a draft board, but was it arbitrary how they picked the names? Was it random or? It was done by magic, I think. Okay. Now, I really don't know. You know, you got uh, classified as 1A and uh, <clears throat> off you went. Okay. Whether or not they had a uh, system. Initially, I think the first few, they had kind of a lottery thing. Okay. And that was really before the war started, uh, when they began to um, draft people uh, even before uh, we were involved. Well, at any rate, I, I went to Jefferson Barracks uh, 
Missouri, which is the, on the south side of St. Louis, Missouri, took my basic training, and uh, wound up being classified to go to a gunner school to become a radio gunner on a, on a bombing plane. And one day a colonel came along and uh, interviewed those of us who had uh, higher IQs and me uh, mechanical aptitudes and so forth and said, we got a deal for you. We have a thing called ASGP, Army Specialized Training Program. And uh, because you're qualified for this, uh, we'd like to suggest this. And uh, uh, it's a good deal if uh, the thing closes down or you flunk out and come back here. And, but otherwise, you will get a... Um, degree in engineering and uh, go right on to Officer's Candidate School. Seemed like a good deal. So I signed up for it. If I ever find that colonel, I'll kill him. Because <clears throat> he lied. <laughs> they sent me first to uh, Grinnell College for reclassification. And then on uh, Halloween night, uh, a group of us uh, were shipped out to uh, Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And um, we arrived uh, there when some of the guys who'd been there, we were at an advanced class, but some people had been there before and they were having a dance and we spent the night sleeping in the bleachers up on the, the side of this big armory, which is at 3400 South Wentworth. Yes, right this is where your, your barracks were supposed right. to be, that they were holding a dance on the floor there? Right. It was an interesting place because uh, we, you got a lot of fog in Chicago back in those days and it's such a big barn that on a good foggy day you had to follow the boards in order to find your way to the mess hall. But at any rate, I met two particularly good friends, Bob Kardash and uh, Charlie Smith and uh, we uh, soon learned our way around downtown Chicago and uh, Bob was a, had a beautiful tenor operatic voice and Charlie was a mathematical whiz. So we were very close friends. This was October, and I think... Uh, 1942 or 1943? Uh, 43. Okay. And uh, so after about one semester, the Army decided that there were better things for us to be doing, and so they closed all the ASDP programs in the Chicago area, at Wake Forest, University of Chicago, and uh, all those schools. So they put about 3,000 of us on a a train and we headed west. For a whole week we were on this train and uh, every morning we'd pull into a little town or up in Montana or whatever, get out, run up and down the main street and get back on the train. And of course those of us who were in the Air Corps kept saying, well we're going out west to a reclassification, but what we were really doing were uh, going uh, off to the infantry. So after almost a full week we wound up at uh, Camp White, Oregon, uh, and near um, Medford, Oregon. And uh, for those of us who had not had infantry training, they gave us a hurry-up uh, case of uh, how to shoot a gun and things of that sort. We'd had a pretty good basic training, but really were not trained in what you do in the infantry. So you knew at this point, though, that you were going to be infantry and not in the Air Corps? There wasn't any question. Okay. <laughs> there wasn't any question from the very beginning. I had an uncle who was the commander for the General Staff School out of Fort Riley, Kansas, and he kept trying to get me to transfer out there because he said, I can take care of you, but I really felt that, you know, that, that's not the proper thing to do, so I, I didn't. But anyway, we, uh, one memorable experience, uh, a bunch of the guys got caught for doing something that they shouldn't do, and so on a Saturday, they had to go out and dig foxholes. What they didn't know was that on Monday, they were going to put us in those foxholes and run tanks over the top of us. Well, they hadn't done, dug enough foxholes, and uh, so we were lined up, and I was number three in the line. When I got there, the foxholes all caved in, so I had to give my gun to somebody else because it wouldn't fit in there. And I'm digging like crazy to try to get enough room to get down in there, and I looked up, and it's this big tank coming right at me. So I got down as far into the thing as I could and this tank was scraping over my helmet and the noise was unbelievable and then after it was all over the dirt was so pushed in they had to dig me out. <laughs> One of my memorable experiences. 
At any rate, we shipped from there down to St. Louis Obispo uh, to a camp and were there for a, a brief time and then moved on to Camp Callum, just north of uh, La Jolla, uh, California. And there we took amphibious training where we would uh, daily go out on these little landing crafts, LCBTs and so forth, and make landings off the coast of San Diego. And uh, after going through this, uh, we then loaded onto a ship the, called the American Legion, which uh, was sunk later in the war, but we did uh, practice landings on San Clemente Island off the coast of California. Uh, and then made a final landing at uh, Camp Pendleton Marine Base, and uh, uh, I think it was there that I finally got a furlough, the first time I'd had a furlough in the whole time. Just real quick here, um, when, you were, when you were practicing your landings, uh, was there any kind of, um, they, was it set up so that you had resistance even on the beach that was, or were you just practicing the logistics of getting on the beach or? For the most part, once in a while they would, you know, set off some dynamite charges okay. and things like that, but uh, for the most part it was uh, simply learning to get off the thing, disperse and keep moving and uh, how to keep your shoes dry when you're in two foot of water, you know, it's, which is hard to drink. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But anyway, <clears throat> came home on furlough and uh, the outfit moved to uh, Camp Beal out in the middle of the desert someplace in California. And from there we went up to uh, uh, Camp Stoneman, which was to be our uh, uh, POE, port of embarkation. Uh, most interesting experience there, uh, the one evening I had uh, written a letter and uh, went to the next barracks to, uh, or the uh, mail clerk would take care of it. And uh, as I was walking between the barracks, I was alerted to the fact that something was happening over on the horizon. It was an enormous fireball. It was the biggest fireball I've ever seen with things shooting out from it and so forth. And I'm looking at this, and it must have been five minutes or so before the shock wave hit. And when that shock wave hit, I, I'm convinced that one of the barracks came up on one end, that there were knots uh, shaken out of the walls of the barracks. Some of the guys came running out, uh, they'd been in the shower, one had his gas mask on, <laughs> they had their guns and no ammunition. But what had happened, uh, this is when uh, the two ammunition ships blew up at Port Chicago. Yes, we've, we've interviewed some veterans from Port Chicago. So oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, so you actually got to see, you got to... I saw it happen. Wow. And, you know, I can see it to this day in my mind. It's terrible. It's a terrible. couple of days later, we uh, were uh, loaded onto a stern wheel uh, steamboat, which turned out to be, I found out later, the Delta Queen. <laughs> so we go down the, what is that, the... Uh, Port, uh, the Chicago River, or the, actually, I think it's the Sacramento River eventually, that runs all the way down to the Bay Bridge uh, to San Francisco Bay. And we went right past where the explosion had taken place, and it was absolutely barren. We were up in that same area on a, on a cruise um, a couple of years ago, uh, a whole week, and never left San Francisco Bay, but we came all the way up past there, and I kept trying to see where that place was. But uh, it's so changed, I, I couldn't identify it. Sure. But in my mind, I knew exactly what it looked like. At any rate, we, we go down to San Francisco Bay, and our ship is uh, located in a, uh, along the wharf, right underneath the Bay Bridge, right close to it. And uh, board the ship, and a few days later, we took off for uh, an unknown destination. It turned out to be Hawaii. And, uh, I think uh, I hadn't been underneath the Golden Gate Bridge before I was already seasick, but that made no difference. We were in these ships where the bunks were like uh, eight high, and you had about 18 inches of space for you, your barracks bag, your weapon, and uh, anything else that you owned. But at any rate, after several days, I uh, overcame my illness, and uh, the ship pulled into a place in Hawaii where there was uh, 
an open shed and they load us into narrow gauge gondola cars and we headed up through the hills past the ammunition dumps and so forth there in Oahu to a uh, tent camp near Wheeling Field and Schofield Barracks up in the middle of Hawaii. And from there, well one day I was, we were watching the planes taking off and a couple of them were doing some uh, practice fighting and one hit the other and the two planes crashed, which was kind of an interesting experience. But I was selected along with some other guys to go over and uh, uh, set up a uh, training camp for, what, for various types of village uh, and jungle fighting. And my responsibility, or our group, was to teach uh, village fighting in the jungles. My job was to lecture about Japanese weapons, of which I didn't know anything, but they told me enough that I could show them how to take it apart and uh, explain various things about uh, the weapons. This was an interesting thing. We had a fellow named Olson who was good with dynamite. <clears throat> And another good friend, the name was uh, Tom Shea, who used to play fullback for the University of uh, uh, Washington in St. Louis. And <clears throat> he would, uh, we would start out by uh, shooting over the heads of the guys who were being lectured, which would scare the blazes out of them. And then Tom Shea would come up to this one building at one end, firing his machine gun from the hip. And when he got to the, this building at the end, the, the fellow who was carrying the tripod would give him a boost, he would hit up on the top of the thing, roll, and stand up there shooting like that. There's a sequel to this that I'll tell you later. Anyway, it was, it was an interesting experience. Uh, we were only busy maybe three days. Sort of, this was sort of like a hazing of the new guys when you were, when you were about to lecture them? You were... No, it just got their attention. Okay. <laughs> they got them to... That's a good way to get somebody's attention. Well, you know, in infantry training, they have uh, infiltration courses, for example, where they're shooting live ammunition right over your head, and uh, you're crawling through mud, and they're shooting dynamite off in mud holes, and you're going under barbed wire, and, uh, you know, you get some real experiences. In fact, at one time, they put a uh, drop of mustard gas on our arms to make sure you knew what it was about, and we would run through uh, in buildings where they had, uh, they would release gas and you had to be in there, uh, sometimes tear gas and others, so you were, you were supposed to take a whiff of it and then put your gas mask back on. But at any rate, uh, we finished all this up and uh, uh, they, they uh, take us back to Pearl Harbor and uh, we got on a ship called the USS Comet which is a misnomer because it was the slowest ship in the convoy when we headed out. And we learned we were to make the beachhead landings on Yap Island and uh, in the Carolinas. So along the way uh, on this uh, uh, ship, which uh, as we got down on the equator, I think it must have been about 115 degrees down in the, in the hole where we were sleeping right in front of the engine room. And it was just on Terribly hot. I mean, you just you couldn't sleep. You only had 18 inches sleeping on a wool blanket. It was miserable. But anyway, we survived. Uh, another fellow and I managed to get a KP job for the officers' mess, so we were eating pretty good. But along the way, uh, we were the operation was called off, and we went to uh, Anawitok Island and, and uh, we were there for a few days, and then went down to the Admiralty Islands off of Los Manos where uh, we were advised that we were going to do a different landing. We'd been on this APA as they call it, this uh, USS Comet, which is nothing more than a troop ship. <clears throat> and we transferred, we were there for a short time and they would take us to the to the shore, beautiful sand beaches down there and uh, we could swim and actually have a, uh, a bottle of beer, which you couldn't do on board the ship. But they transferred us to uh, LSTs, which uh, have amphibious trackers on the, what they call the tank deck. And we learned that we were to make the, uh, we, we were to help MacArthur, who was uh, known locally as Dugout Doug, Artless Art, and other similar names, 
when we were to help him to return to the Philippines. So we take off in the uh, LST and uh, um, about three or four days out, we went uh, down to the tank deck and we were assigned our amphibious tracker and the fellow who was in charge <clears throat> announced uh, where we were to stand and things of that sort. And I'm, you know, just casually looking around at this affair. But uh, uh, one of the guy who was supposed to be in charge of this thing uh, said, Smitty, uh, when we get ashore, you're to get the ramp down. I turn around, here's a fellow who was a fraternity brother from the University of Cincinnati that I knew that I had not seen. So it was kind of interesting, <laughs> he was on the Valley, uh, same end of his tractor. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> At any rate, I think it was a, the uh, day before, two nights before we got to the Philippines, uh, the officers had a, uh, sponsored an amateur contest. So another fellow and I got a song and dance thing together and uh, we won first prize. And they gave us U.S. dollars. We had to convert all our other money into Philippine invasion money. So we were uh, a few of the fellows who had U.S. dollars. So at any rate, uh, we arrived at uh, Lady Golf, and uh, they had us up early in the morning. You're sleeping up on deck, you know, and uh, outside, top. There were no, wasn't enough room, you know. They had a cot, and we were sleeping on this particular uh, LST. They had an LCT on top that was sitting on rail ties, and when they would get to, after they let us off, they would uh, uh, tilt the ship by adjusting the ballast tanks, and this thing would slip, slide off sideways. Well, we were sleeping underneath that thing. Some were sleeping on top of it, and uh, but we were underneath where it was reasonably dry with the nightly rains. But anyway, we arrived, and uh, they had us up early. The landing was to be at 10 o'clock. Did you know the night before that you were going to be making the landing the next day? Had they told well, we you? knew, you know, from the time we got on, uh, well, we knew we were going to make a landing somewhere from the time we got on the uh, left of Hawaii. But, uh, uh, yes, we knew we were in wave five. We knew everything was... Been, was it, did you did you get any sleep the night before? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. Just, okay, so there wasn't a problem there? Oh, well, you know, excited, but, uh, but they had us up at, like, Three o'clock in the morning, or something like that. Okay. Three thirty. But in order to eat on the LST, they had a <clears throat> uh, a mess area, and you had to line up outside and walk through and get your food and then sit down. Well, we were in the midst of doing this, and a lone Japanese fixed pontoon airplane, like they used to hang on the back of a cruiser, started flying down overhead. Well, every ship in the Pacific Fleet opened fire on that plane. They had the spotlights up on it. There wasn't, and the plane never changed direction, and they never touched it. <laughs> and in the meantime, all the iron that was up in the air was beginning to fall back on deck, and we're trying to find shelter someplace or other. Well, at any rate, uh, we finally get down into our uh, amphibious trackers and uh, it's always exciting when you come out the end of this thing because you have to judge just when the waves are going. In fact, on one of our practice landings, we'd gotten in there sideways. And <clears throat> on another one, we made some practice landings in Maui and uh, Hawaii. Uh, one of those things sank, and I think seven guys were caught in the thing. You know, wow. they're like a rock once the, the bilge pump stop. But we, we get down and head off, and uh, you follow along, uh, there's a Coast Guard guy who leads you down and then you're supposed to circle around until you get to the uh, LOD line of departure, which is usually about a thousand yards out. And uh, there were two of us uh, qualified to um, handle a 50 caliber machine gun. I was one of them. And the boat crew handles the other one. And then there are two 30 calibers on each side. So the the other guy said, I'll handle the 50, and I said, that's fine. So, the, 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 we were uh, company messengers, and uh, there were four company messengers in my Amtrak, and then my, there were always two company messengers, and the other uh, company messenger from Company F, which was my company, was um, uh, in another of the Amtraks. 
And the other group in there was an anti-tank group. That was the one that Smitty was uh, with. And they had the anti-tank gun in there, so he had to kind of climb over that. But uh, I said, that's fine. So I moved over to the right side of the Amtrak. And this thing, vibration and noise is unbelievable as it's moving along. But I, I realized that they're bringing us in on the wrong beach. But I'm not really in charge. You can, <laughs> there wasn't much you could do anyway. Some Coast Guard guys leading over to uh, Orange uh, 1 instead of Orange 2, where my company was landing. So we're out there circling, getting ready to go in. And about the time we got to the uh, LOD and, and we're ready to move in, the guy on the gun says, hey, Vern, i got to take a smoke. Would you take over the gun? So I take over the gun, and he moves to the head of this line. Everybody moves down, and a fellow named uh, Tony Gamooch moved to where I was standing. So we head in, and... Uh, get all lined up, you know, and off you go, and uh, there's a, the airplanes are strafing the beach, and, and there are uh, LSTs with these rockets, shooting rockets off, and the, the heavy guns from the battleships and everything are beating the coast. This is a landing with two divisions abreast, which is really a much bigger landing than Normandy, because you have to have all your supplies, there's two divisions abreast, and uh, uh, four beachheads, and I would like to say before I go any further, I was in Company F, 383rd uh, Infantry Regiment, 96th Division. Uh, we were originally part of the 10th Corps, uh, commanded by Admiral Nimitz, but we had been uh, commandeered by uh, MacArthur to uh, his 6th Division, I think it was 6th Army, uh, 6th Army. And anyway, we were going in, I take over the 50 caliber, and we get uh, in close enough that uh, I can call the, what they call clear the gun and just shoot a couple of rounds with the butterfly to make sure that the bullet, the uh, ammo is moving through the receiver properly. And I can see the, the gun flashes from the Japs up on this hill called Catman Hill on our right flank. So I'm arching the fire in. You've got to see the tracers, you know, and you can shoot it like shooting a garden hose, you know, to hit a target. And about this time, the Japs had uh, recovered enough, and they were shooting their cannons, their rifle, their, their uh, uh, heavy artillery, and ricocheting the shells. And uh, you know, I could see the first ones come down, and they would bounce along, and the next one hit pretty close. And they were, they were ricocheting the shells off the water. Yeah, okay. okay. You know, with the boats lined up, if you did miss one, you catch the next one. And the next one hit pretty close, and we got splashed pretty well. But the next one came right through Tony Gamooch yeah. and exploded right back of us. And it was a bloody mess in there. And uh, in fact, the, the fellow in the next Amtrak said that uh, we were actually plumping blood out the bilge pumps. They could see the red water coming out. At any rate, we continue in, and uh, I'm still on the 50. It felt like somebody hit me in the face with a pillow, but uh, you know. I, afraid to touch anything <laughs> because I'm just an absolute bloody mess, you know, I just was splattered. The fellow right back of me literally had gotten his head blown off and all that. He was on the 30 caliber right back of me. And found out later after we got ashore that uh, Smitty had both his arms blown off and he died later back on the beach. But anyway, we, we got ashore and uh, the guy running the Amtrak uh, promptly stalled the engine out, and while he's trying to get it started, uh, we take another round, and uh, so we bail out, go running out of this Amtrak, and uh, and drop down. You know, and the tops of coconut trees are being blown off, and uh, things happening all around you, and uh, you're trying to get your wits about you. I suddenly realized I'd left something in the Amtrak, and I went running back in to gather that up, and I dropped back down again, and I'll swear a Jap ran right in front of me, and I didn't even recognize him. <laughs> so you were just on the beach, I mean, you were, you were not... They oh, were, were on the beach, beach, yeah. So were you trying to, could you take cover, were there any shell holes or anything like that, or you just were laying flat on the laying beach? Laying flat, yeah, okay. Um, the shells were going overhead, and it's hard to tell whose they were, you know. The right. thing is, so often, the people who were 
giving you cover don't realize that we're ashore and uh, some of that ammunition falls a little short so it's hard to tell but uh, there was a lot of gunfire and so forth it was interesting uh, when we were on the LST I was carrying a carbine and they forgot to load carbine ammunition so we pulled alongside another LST and they put a few cases of ammunition over and uh, uh, I'm, I had, I think, a total of 30 rounds of ammunition. That's all I had. And they also forgot to load uh, enough hand grenades. So I had one hand grenade, and the four guys had to stay with me. Normally, you have three hand grenades. So I had the one hand grenade for, for four guys. For four guys. Right. So we we figured that uh, if we could use our guns as uh, clubs, we probably were going to do a better job than shooting because we didn't have enough to to uh, do much firing. But anyway, we move along and I realized we were on the wrong beach and so I found my uh, partner, a fellow named uh, uh, A. Wall, we always call him A. Wall, and he was a follower who would, who would uh, if I'd say go left, we go left. So we moved down the beach and there was a big trench that had been dug by the Japs uh, to stop tanks and we had to wade through that and head along. And, uh, our communication sergeant, battalion communication sergeant, uh, told us to go out and find our company. So AWOL and I head off. We knew they were to the left of the front. So we head off. We're going through the jungles and through swamps. A uh, typhoon had hit a few days before we got there, so everything was deep in the water. And we're following logs and so forth and not really sure where our company was. Finally, after going for some distance, we came to a little hammock that was a little above the water, and uh, I hadn't seen any trail, any indication anybody had been through there. And I said, hey, well, I think we're out in front of the company. I said, why don't we settle down? There's a big tree there with big roots that came down. I said, you get on one side, and I'll get on the other, and let's just wait here for a few minutes. About a half an hour later, the first scout from our company came through. <laughs> And we scared the devil out of them. We told them we'd already conquered this part. Yeah. <laughs> the first night uh, in combat, we wound up out in a swampy area. You know, water was a couple inches deep, and uh, we're uh, digging in, and you dig in and fill with water. And about the time we got our foxhole dug, the uh, Japs opened with the artillery, and we're laying down in that hole in the water with barely our noses above, you know, with shells falling around us. But the uh, night went on without too much activity. The first battalion was on our right flank, and uh, every time a flare goes up when you're under combat conditions, and it begins to get low, the shadows begin to move, and you're instructed not to move when a flare goes up and just follow things with your eyes. Well, when you see movement right and left, you're not sure what it is. Well, the 1st Battalion spent the whole night fighting a banana grove. We kidded them about <laughs> that for a long time. But we continued on through the swamps. Uh, uh, my leggings actually rotted off. We were, we were wet constantly. It rained and you were sitting in the water and uh, we finally got to the backside of uh, Catman Hill, and um, our supplies had not caught up with us. We were literally living off of pineapple, uh, off of uh, coconuts that the natives would knock down for us, or that we could knock down. And um, we had already developed some of those uncomfortable diseases that you get in the in the jungles. But uh, the communication sergeant uh, asked me to go back and see if I could find where the supply lines, or the supply group was. And uh, usually you travel in groups of two, but for whatever reason, I was doing it alone. And I head back in the direction where it was, they were supposed to be. And there's a big, big tall elephant grass, and the typhoon had kind of blown it down in swells like this, and I was following along through that. And all of a sudden, I heard a bullet pop past my ear, so I dropped down and tried to figure out where it was and who was shooting at me. It just as well have been one of our own guys. Mm -hmm. I waited for a while and I got up and 
pop. Another one goes, you can hear it when a bullet goes right past your ear, it makes a popping sound. So it wasn't far off. So I'm thinking it's going to get darker before long and I can't spend the night because after dark, anything that moves gets shot. So I pick up and go dashing down one of these swells and nobody shot at me. And uh, I got back to our, uh, our perimeter for the night and the supply lines of the, or the supply people had gotten through and, and uh, I hadn't even known about it. We got to the foot of Catman Hill and uh, we'd pretty well driven the Japs off, but there were still some attacks that were coming through. My job daily was to uh, go up and communicate with the company and find out if there anything going on. This required running around the back side of uh, this tail on, on the mountain that the pilots called the, the frying pan the frying pan, I think it was. But uh, you had to run through an open area, and every time you'd run through there, the Japs would shoot at you, and then up through a gully and up to where the front lines were. But about the second day that we were there at uh, Catman Hill, the Japs came in with paratroopers, and uh, they were strafing the beaches, and uh, Tom Shea, picked up his uh, machine gun and firing from the hip shot down one of the Jap airplanes. Oh, really? Yeah, he, well he had practice, you know, in the village fight. Sure, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was, uh, everybody was really excited about that. Um, we then uh, cleaned up the area there a bit and um, had a couple of guys who begin to find out that you don't collect souvenirs because they were all booby trapped and uh, and one day they, they dropped water and supplies for us and the, the Navy planes uh, dropped it out in the, in the no man's land and um, we had to launch an attack to go out and get our supplies but we went back to the beach and one of the things that happened to me was that uh, in running from uh, across that open area, the one time I had tripped on combat wire, this thin wire that they'd string out between the various uh, com command points, and put a just a like a wire burn on the back side of my leg. Well, that began to get infected, and uh, when we got back to the beach where we were going to spend a couple of days, uh, I went over to the medics because the thing was getting red and I was getting blood poisoning in it. I forgot also, uh, I think it must have been, well, right after we got out of the Amtrak and we were moving along, uh, one of the medics stopped me and said, let me take a look at you, something's wrong. Well, I, I knew that something was wrong, but I was afraid to touch it. <laughs> but anyway, he, he says, are those Japs using uh, glass bullets? Or you've got glass all over your face. Well, I'd known that one of the lenses was missing from my sunglasses. And what had happened was that one piece of shrapnel had split my lip and took off a piece of meat out of my nose, went through the sunglasses, <clears throat> another piece of my elbow and a piece of my hand. But I, you know, pretty well ignored that. But uh, second or third day in or whatever it was, I went over to the medics to uh, put a bandage on my hand here and uh, there was a young Filipino boy there who had been injured some way or other and had uh, gotten gas gangrene. I've never seen anything like this. This fellow looked like a balloon and the medics were afraid to even put a, a needle into him for fear that it would uh, be a disaster. So I decided I really didn't need treatment at that point. Now, so, that, just a quick question. How, how old were you when, when you made the landing on the lady? Twelve. <laughs> no, I was, um, I guess, 19 or 20. Wow. 20, I guess. Okay. Far too young to be doing things like that. I guess I was 19. 
probably 19. But anyway, we left the beach and we were going to uh, march back into the mountains and uh, continue finding the Japs back there. And along the way, they, we were told to move into a, a coconut grove and pitch our tents and be prepared for bad weather. Well, what happened was a typhoon came through, so we spent about two days in a pup tent with the water rising <laughs> in the pup tent and every place else. With coconuts flying through the air and uh, a pup tent leaks. So it was two days of pure misery. But we get back into the mountains and uh, we're setting up a perimeter and cutting off the Japs and uh, a few encounters with them. And uh, the other battalion, one of the other battalions was at another forward area that they were supplying by airdrop. And the weather closed in, they couldn't get the airdrops in. So they selected some volunteers, of which I was volunteered, to carry rations up to them. And <clears throat> they gave me a, uh, a case of sea rations, which weighs 64 pounds. That's embrazened in my mind. <laughs> Because if you ever try to carry 64 pounds in a square wooden box for about three or four miles in the mountains, you've never really lived. <laughs> I started out with it up on one shoulder and then on the other shoulder. I held it in front of me, I held it in my hips and back. I tried shoving it for a while. Finally got it up to the where it was supposed to and somebody said, we need a few of you to carry it up a little bit further. Well, we all evaporate into the jungle. <laughs> then a few days later, our mess sergeant, who enjoyed combat, uh, got a few of us together, and these were volunteers. We were going to uh, set up a, an advanced location. Uh, we'd have uh, a lieutenant uh, and a, a group of his artillery people for spotters. And we headed off with uh, about three days of ration. And it was a, quite an adventure. It was, uh, we hadn't gone far. We had to scale down a cliff holding on to vines and cross a river and got to a deep ravine. And there was, the only way across was a log and uh, <clears throat> nothing to hold on to. And we had to walk across that. And it was muddy from everybody's shoes. Finally got to a little clearing way back in the mountains where somebody had cut down some enormous big trees and there were three Nippa huts there. So we stationed ourselves in those Nippa huts and uh, prepared to cut off the, the Jap. Well, we were kind of up above it. It was kind of interesting to see the artillery falling on the Japs down below us. This, about the first night there, this lieutenant had a nightmare that he was being attacked by a boa constrictor and we had a terrible time quieting him down. Well, these skin ulcers got worse and worse, and uh, my hand remained infected, and uh, I had amoebic dysentery and a few other things, and so they decided to uh, send me back to the aid station to, uh, so we were riding down the hill in a weapons carrier, and the uh, commanding officer for the uh, heavy weapons, the H company, was riding along and he had these ulcers in a most uncomfortable place on his rear end. And after riding a short time, he said, stop, I'll walk down the side of the mountain. <laughs> That's another point. We did it when, before I was being evacuated. Uh, I was up there on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, our cooks down the hill had cooked up some turkey and brought them up in GI cans. And the only thing I had to eat on Thanksgiving Day was one slice of turkey. And the, the lieutenant from H Company was trying to tout me out of that. <laughs> so we were really just not getting good ration. We were living on the land, uh, killing somebody's chickens. And one day some a native came through with a slab of water buffalo. And we, we bought that. We'd occasionally get some rations and add what were called uh, Cahotes were like sweet potatoes, and you cook it in your helmet. At any rate, I get down to this field hospital uh, down in San Jose, I think it is. One of the fellows 
had been wounded. His name was uh, Bill Elliott. We called him Wild Bill. And uh, another fellow uh, uh, had also been wounded. But uh, Bill had been operated, and they took him, took him back into the, the chapel there. And when he came to, he saw the angels up on the ceiling, and he thought he was dead. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, after a few days there in the hospital, they decided that they couldn't really do much about it, and they decided to evacuate me from there. <clears throat> so I went down to the airstrip down at Tycloven and was evacuated uh, by air with a stopover at uh, Paleyboo in the Palatos, which was a, still a very heavy combat activity. The 81st Infantry and a couple of these uh, fellows with the funny uniforms, the Marines uh, divisions were there. But we went from there to Biak in the Shanton Island, just off the neck of New Guinea, on the other side of the equator. And uh, they, uh, they worked on my uh, diarrhea, which was a matter of uh, giving you a handful of business tablets. And this eventually was like a big cork. And then they would uh, try to get the cork out. There was an old story about this one fellow who was uh, sitting in the latrine, which is down at the end of the uh, <clears throat> the end of the long tent that was a ward. And he was at the cork stage. And this other fellow was in dark, and he comes running down, and he hears this fellow. Um, released his bowels as he went along. And uh, the guy sitting there said, boy, I'd do anything to do that. And the fellow said, wait till I get my trousers down. You haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> but also they, uh, they were treated, trying to take care of uh, these other little things that had been bothering me. And after a period of time, they released me from the hospital and went to what's called a casualty camp. A casualty camp is a group of fellows who are no longer connected with any division and they can take you and put you anywhere they want to put you. So we were bored. I volunteered for a couple of uh, uh, scouting missions. Uh, there were still Japs back in the hills, and we were uh, trying to route them out. And uh, otherwise, they weren't really paying a lot of attention. The airstrip was not too far away, and I went over there and uh, uh, managed to hitchhike a ride on a, on a bombing run over at um, Truck Island on a B-24, and then I began to realize, you know, that I don't want to go to somebody, others, somebody else's division, so I thought, I'm going to see if I can't get a ride back to the Philippines. Well, I went there several days and finally uh, got cleared to go on a, on a plane that was going to fly up there, and then got bumped at the last moment, and I'm kind of just hard watching this plane take off and promptly crash at the end of the runway. <laughs> Uh, but then a couple of days later, I managed to get on a C-54, the early four-engine uh, transport planes. And we're flying non-stop back to uh, the Philippines, and uh, our left outboard engine caught fire. So we flew on three engines, landed in Taiwan, and then I had to try to find out how to get back to my outfit. So I, I managed to find the regimental supply area. And I'm standing here trying to figure out how to get from there to wherever my company might be. And some fellow in a Jeep comes past, puts on his brakes and backs up. And it's my neighbor from my hometown who recognized me there. He says, I'll drive you there. So our outfit was still way back in the mountains uh, on an island. Uh, but we were in reserve at that point in time. So I walked in and told the uh, commander, company Captain Larson, I'm back. And uh, uh, he said, fine. <laughs> I went on. I'm still AWOL from someplace down in BIAC. You know? <laughs> so we did some training there and, and uh, found we were going to go off to do another landing. The next one was going to be uh, Okinawa. Uh, so after a bit of uh, additional training and uh, everybody trying to get their health back together again, uh, we boarded ships headed uh, up uh, the, in the uh, South China Sea in a convoy and got involved in a uh, 
typhoon in the middle of this. I was uh, loading uh, supplies on a dumb waiter way at the bottom of the ship. And I wasn't aware of the fact that we'd gotten into this heavy weather, but I wasn't feeling well. Well, it wasn't long. I knew I was uh, getting seasick, which I hadn't done for some time. I'd, you know, I'd spent a lot of time at sea uh, by this time. Sure. At any rate, I got topside and half the ship was sea seasick and the waves were bouncing up and down and uh, the ship was bouncing all over everywhere. Right in the middle of this, this brand new APA Victory class ship that we were on lost its main bearing. So they put out a sea anchor and we're out there drifting in the middle of the typhoon and the whole uh, Pacific fleet goes off and leaves us. After about 24 hours they got it fixed and we're sailing again, went about 12 hours and lost a bearing again. But at any rate, we got to Okinawa, which is a landing to be April the 1st, uh, uh, 1945, I guess it was. And uh, there was not a ripple on the ocean. It was a flat, and there wasn't even a swell. It was absolutely flat. On top of that, there was a heavy fog, and the Japs had no idea that we were there. It was one of those situations where they used a, a group of these fellows with the funny uniforms to do a fake landing down at the southern end of the island and then to draw all the Japs down there. And we're, this was a uh, four division operation, two infantry divisions, my division 96 on the right, 7th division on the left, and then two of the marine divisions up north. The northern end of the island uh, had poisonous snakes, three kinds of poisonous snakes but no Japs. But we figured the Marines could probably deal with the, the snakes and uh, <clears throat> it wouldn't be too much of a deal. So we load off into amphibious tractors and take off. I'm in wave two on this landing. And we were concerned about it because we had to go over a, a reef uh, with these Amtraks at, as the tide was going out and then up to a seawall and then we would have to climb out the front of the Amtrak uh, with ladders. And uh, we had the, the distinct feeling that this was going to be a, like a shooting gallery as, as you come up out of the tank. But as it turned out, we didn't even see a Jap until, uh, I think, late that afternoon. But things began to get a little more intense as, uh, as the uh, week went along. I think it was about the third day that uh, things really got, uh, got going. And then about the sixth or seventh day, um, we were on the approaches to Kakazu Ridge. And uh, this was really a rough uh, uh, bit of going. And um, I'm still with the battalion. I'm the company messenger that goes from the battalion to the company and AWOL was the one going the other way. And uh, so we're just kind of following along, you know, the, the guys are right out in front, you're moving with them. So we got ourselves kind of pinned down in, a, in an area, uh, an open area, and uh, some guy comes running along and flops down beside me, and it turns out to be Colonel May, who was a regimental commander, whom I didn't necessarily recognized, but I didn't know him that well. Uh, but he says, uh, he says, soldier, where's your squad? I said, I'm a company messenger. I don't have a squad. Well, he said, let's get a couple of guys. We've got to get, take care of that machine gun nest over there. I said, I don't really think that I can get a couple of guys together. At any rate, he went dashing off to find a, a more combative group, I guess. <laughs> but uh, we got volunteered to carry back one of the guys who'd been uh, wounded, and uh, so there were four of us on this stretcher, and this uh, poor guy had been uh, rather badly wounded, and, and we're running under fire, there's a machine gun shooting over and over. And if you think uh, carrying 64 pound rations for several miles is tough, four men on a stretcher bent over running is uh, is a very uh, 
exhausting experience, believe me. But we got him back to the regimental aid station, and then uh, a group of us, there have been several been carrying uh, wounded back, or heading back to our outfit, and we're walking along on the side of a kind of a coral cliff, and uh, he had to walk around this kind of a narrow shelf-like area, and the uh, first two guys up there go along, and they both got shot, so we had to find another way to get up. Finally got up to where we're supposed to be, and uh, they moved us over to the left, right behind my company, which was up on the uh, slopes up ahead. I dug in, and uh, as the first flare went up, I realized that I was fully exposed from the people up in front. Looked around, and uh, here was a Japs squatted just right behind me. Well, all night long, it was a heavy bit of uh, artillery, and the next morning, it was a big attack from the Japs, and they were running through the area, swinging shovels and things. The next day, they moved us around to another part, and uh, we stopped halfway around the backside of this hill, and the, the artillery is coming crashing in over our heads, and we finally moved over where we're supposed to be. And the first night I said, okay, I'll, uh, to my foxhole buddy, I'll take the first watch until the moon comes up. So I just Mr. Corbin, stop there. Actually, we're going to put another tape in because we're running out of oh. time, which is fine. So we'll switch that and then we'll get back to the story. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, Mr. Corbin, we were talking before uh, we were on uh, Okinawa and you uh, had taken the first night's watch. Right. So it's uh, dark, we're under a lot of artillery fire. Every once in a while you hear somebody yell across the perimeter, medic, and at one time uh, one of the squad leaders, Sergeant Donovan, came running over looking for a cave because his men were getting badly shot up. It was, you know, a pretty active night. And I, where we were sitting was not more than 50 feet from where the ammunition dump was located. It's on the back side of a little uh, coral cliff and uh, I could hear noise over there and I kept thinking, you know, I've got to be a chap or somebody going to set that whole thing off. Well, the moon began to come up and I'm looking at, across this big valley that ran off to our right flank and the, uh, I guess it was a second, uh, the 382nd Regiment was in reserve on our right uh, rear flank. And as I'm looking out there, I suddenly see this this white thing explode right where the chaps were located. It just It just seemed to suddenly be there. And then it went floating down across this valley, you know, maybe several hundred yards away. And you could see it just floating like this until it got back to where the other battalion, the other regiment was located. And it, again, just seemed to kind of explode. And then this thing comes right at me. I thought, I've never seen a ghost before in my life, but this is a ghost. But it was a white goat that ran right over the top of my head. Oh, really? <laughs> well, how, how come it looked like it was exploding? I don't know. I guess it was just the way the moonlight hit okay. thing, you know, <laughs> what it was. Well, I was adequately spooked by that time, you know. but. Uh, at any rate, it was a very long and eventful night. <clears throat> and the next day, I guess, uh, they finally decided that uh, the Marines did not need their artillery to kill the poisonous snakes. So they brought the artillery down to reinforce ours. And this Marine group of uh, forward observers were standing around where we were. And I told them, you'd better find yourself a foxhole. Uh, you know, the hot shot, they weren't going to pay any attention to that. And uh, before long, I told them, that's an empty foxhole right there. Before long, this artillery starts coming in, and this Marine jumps into my foxhole. I jump on top of him with my knife, and I put it right to the back of his neck, and I said, you're going to get out. I'm not going to get killed because you're such an idiot. Well, it was... It was a very eventful bit during that 
time. In the meantime, my skin ulcers, which had never been cured, had gotten worse. I had blood poisoning in my leg, and uh, so they decided to evacuate me, which I was happy to have them do. I didn't think that I was hurt as bad as some of the other guys, but uh, one doesn't uh, argue with the military, particularly when you have an opportunity to leave for this uh, activity, because it was it just, it's hard to imagine. A short time ago, uh, one of my friends from the same division called me and said, uh, are you going to go over to see this saving Private Ryan? Mm -hmm. I said, I really didn't have much interest in seeing that. I said, I've already seen combat. I don't need to see right. it again. Well, he said, I'm going, my wife and I. I said, why don't you and uh, your wife, Joan, join us? So we agreed. And afterwards, somebody asked me, uh, is that really what combat is like? Nobody can describe what combat is like. You're laying in your foxhole and the, this artillery is going over your head and uh, it goes this way and it goes that way. And you watch these battleships shoot these big 16-inch shells. You can see the tracers coming over and it explodes out in front of you and suddenly the Japs are at you. and and you haven't eaten regularly, and uh, the toilet facilities are difficult under <laughs> all these conditions. You're tired. Uh, I guess you're scared. You've reached the point where being scared is really not a word that you can use. It's just you're numb to all of this. And uh, one of the terrible things is that when somebody gets shot, there's a sense of relief. It wasn't me, you know, it was somebody else. And uh, so it's, there's no way to describe what it's like to be under heavy artillery fire, under constant attack, little or no sleep, not enough food, and uh, cold, often soaked all the way through. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. It's not like seeing Private Ryan. That's right. not the way war is. You don't have these occasions where everybody's sitting around and chatting. You're forever trying to find where your hole is going to be and uh, decide how you're going to dig this thing. There are funny experiences, you know, that happen. In the Philippines, uh, when we were at the frying pan, uh, I had dug a hole alongside a little levee in a rice paddy. And uh, when you're there, you know, as you begin to s spend the next day, you dig in a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. About the third day, I thought, I'm going to go one shovel deeper, and I hit a spring. So my whole foxhole fills up with water. They're just, you know, the things of that sort that are... Now, when did you do in that instance? Did you try to bail it out or did you just have to go dig Well, I had to get mud and poke the thing, you know, try to fill that thing back in again and eventually bail it out. But uh, what was the other uh, funny experience I was going to tell? There are things that happen that are, you know... Uh, well, I, I know what it was. As the replacement AST peers, the old guys in the company used to always say, if you think this is rough, you should have been on maneuvers. <laughs> well, right in the middle of one of these very heavy artillery barrages, you know, what happens is they do a rolling barrage. You shoot here, and then they here, and here, then they move back and over this way, and you're waiting for the next one to come over, you know. And there's kind of an interval in between while they're changing their ranges. Well, right in the middle of this, on this, up on Kakazoo Hill, one of these Marines yells out, if you think this is rough, you should have been on maneuvers. <laughs> well, the guys are laughing all around the perimeter. <laughs> At any rate, I'm evacuated back to a, a hospital. And uh, I think about the second or third day, I'm on a litter on the ground. And uh, they had the first of the uh, heavy Japanese uh, airplane raids. And you can actually see the tracers going through our tent. 
All the medics had disappeared to their foxholes and they left us laying there. And about the fourth day, uh, they came through and uh, couldn't find my name. And uh, they looked it up and said, oh, you were supposed to have been evacuated. So off we go to a ship that was floating out there as a holding ship while they further evacu evaluated the people. And uh, we were under Kamikaze Act all night, every night. After about four days or so, uh, they put me over on the, into the hospital ship Comfort. The hospital ships would stay in fairly close during the day. They're painted white, and at night they'd sail way out because they kept the lights on, but they didn't want to create a uh, silhouette for the ships that were there. But uh, about the second day on that, we got hit with a kamikaze, which was kind of... They hit the hospital ship? Yeah, hit the, right in the operating room. But we finally, we get all the people on the ship that they can handle, and we take off, and we have a submarine alert. Now, I don't know whose submarine it was, but finally got to Saipan and uh, went into a hospital there, and after a week or so, they decided to evacuate me further, so on an airplane and flew to uh, Kwajalein, spent the night, and flew from there to Johnson Island, Johnson Island to Hawaii, to uh, Schofield General Hospital up in the middle of the island. And uh, while I was there, they uh, were trying to find some cure for the skin ulcer and uh, treating me for uh, two different kinds of intestinal infections that I had, hookworm and some other foreign salmon thing. And uh, then they decided to do something about my hand because uh, the x-ray revealed there's still a piece of shrapnel in there. So I went in for a surgery for that and they found that it was stuck down in the ligaments and they didn't want to mess around with it so they decided to sew it up and leave it there. And uh, you still have the shrapnel on your hand today? Yeah. And they did some patchwork on my nose. Um, but uh, one of the guys in our ward uh, began to uh, organize a, a show. So I was asked to uh, be one of the singers. And so I recall one of the songs I was going to sing was Deep Purple. And I forgot the words and had to make up my own. <laughs> And the fellow in charge of this later, who had been in vaudeville someplace or other, uh, said, you know, those weren't bad words, but why didn't you use the original? <laughs> One of the fellows I mentioned before, a fellow named Donovan, who was a fellow who always organized the sporting activities and so forth, a uh, very active guy, you know, very likable person, had uh, stepped on a, what we call a yardstick, a form of a Japanese mine, had both his feet blown off. I found he was in one of the wards and I was ambulatory. In fact, I was going around pushing a piano and, and singing in some of the wards. And uh, I went over to see Donovan. Well, here he is. When you have your uh, something amputated, they, they put a thing to pull the skin down. So there he is on his buttocks, and he was older than we were, with his two legs up like this. And another fellow whose hand had been badly shot up had a big thing like this pulling this out. He was radar, and Donnie was an ack ack. And, they were, and he was just entertaining him. Well, I found that he had been going around to the wards and talking to some of the guys because he was so upbeat and everything. So I would push him around and talk to some of the, the fellows. He never met a fellow who was uh, able to deal with his. Problem. I went in one day and uh, he said they were in talking to me about uh, getting some artificial feet. He said, you know what? I can get aluminum feet. And with aluminum feet being lighter, I'll run faster than I ever did before. Some years later, at one of my infantry reunions, one of the, uh, uh, I, I was talking about this to one of the fellows who had been in the hospital with him after he came back to the States. And he, uh, said, well, let me tell you the rest of the story. He said, is there anything special that you'd like to have? He said, yes, I'd like to be taller. 
So they gave him feet to make him two inches taller than he'd been before. <laughs> but just a real great guy. Sergeant uh, Larley, who had been uh, badly wounded and had lost his arm because the medics in his hospital had put on a bandage that was too tight, shut off the blood supply, and they had to amputate his arm, and he was just bitter. And Donovan couldn't get him to react at all or anything. At any rate, after a period of time in this uh, uh, Letterman General Hospital, they put me in a convalescent hospital, which was what they call the back road to Schofield, down in the middle of a big pineapple field. And I met a fellow there named Stanley Carpenter, who had been an MP, and uh, he and I got a job uh, working in the induction center there. But we would also play handball. And this one day, I hit this ball and this piece of shrapnel in my hand began to poke through. So I went down to talk to the doctor down there and he said, oh, he said, we can take care of that right here. And he said, oh, you don't need any anesthetic or anything for that. So he cut it and pulled it out and gave me that little piece of shrapnel, which I carried around with me for a while. But we would go down to uh, uh, Honolulu and we had a favorite restaurant, which is right across the street from the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And uh, the bar would close there at like 1 o'clock or something. But right across the street is where all the submarine people stayed. And so we were, the submarine people and the infantry guys got along very well. And so this one day they asked Stanley and I if we'd like to uh, come over there. So they'd get the bar is open and everything, fine. Well, they said, you've got to put on some uh, uniforms. So we went up their room and put on CPO uniforms, went down to the Shell Bar, I think they called it, and uh, we ordered a beer and hadn't been there more than a minute or two, and somebody comes through saying, we've got an inspection. The guy said, you better get out of here. We couldn't remember what room we were in. And we're in CPO uniforms, so it took a while to get our uniforms and sneak out of the place. Another time we were down there, uh, some people came running out of a church and said, the war is over, the war is over. It's on a Sunday morning. And uh, they were trying to bring us into the church and, and do some praying. Well, we'd done a lot of praying before and we didn't feel that we needed at that point. We just wanted to be out where we yell and celebrate. After a period of time, they decided that uh, they weren't going to send me back in my outfit. Uh, so when, when they uh, came out of the church, that was the day that the, that the uh, Japanese surrendered? Yes. Where were you when you heard about the first bomb? I was in Honolulu. Um, were you in the hospital at that day, at that particular time? Well, I was in the convalescent hospital at the time. I'm not sure exactly where I was when we heard about it. Okay. But uh, for all those people who think dropping that bomb was uh, a terrible thing, let me tell you, uh, I was scheduled to go back with my outfit and we would have been the beachhead landing on Kyushu and uh, None of us would be around. In fact, far more people would have been killed than were killed because of those bombs. And I have no regrets whatsoever. Harry Truman will be my hero forever for having the guts to, to do that. And it was a terrible thing. But uh, there are a lot of things about war that are terrible. And uh, that's just one of the things that happens. At any rate, after a period of time, uh, we were going to be taken back to the States and we got on board a ship called the President Jackson, one of the old President Line ships. The keel had been laid back in the 1800s. We get back to San Francisco and we're coming under the Golden Gate Bridge and everybody's over on one side of the ship and they'd blown their ballast tanks and the whole ship began to go like this. <laughs> So the captain is on getting off of the railings. So everybody runs back to the middle of the ship and the ship comes back around again. We pull into the dock and uh, the uh, ship was leaning so far they had trouble getting it up to the dock because of the overhang from the warehouse there. But anyway, we go from there to the Letterman General Hospital and I'm there for a period of time and uh, then onto a uh, hospital train. I remember forever stopping and 
Ogden, Utah, in the middle of the night, where these ladies came on board and uh, gave us books and candy and uh, were most gracious. I, it was the first welcome we really had, you know. So I went from there to uh, Camp Carson General Hospital near Colorado Springs. They were having trouble curing me of this one intestinal parasite. And my skin ulcers had finally begun to heal. There was a New York doctor in, uh, uh, at the hospital in Schofield Barracks who came up with a combination of a zinc paste and penicillin, which finally did it. He dreamed the thing up and that nothing else would work. But anyway, I was at Camp Carson and got a furlough, second one I'd had during the war, and went home. Came back and they didn't want to let me go, and I said, you know, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life here waiting for you to find some way to get rid of this intestinal parasite. And finally they were convinced that uh, if I didn't go back to a tropic zone again for a period of time, it would probably take care of itself. And I swore that I would not go back to the tropics for some period of time. And whether I still have that parasite, I don't know. But uh, at any rate, I finally was uh, discharged from uh, Camp Carson uh, General Hospital. A couple of footnotes. Uh, first of all, um, for those who have seen General MacArthur walk ashore on Lady Island, what you saw was a second landing. The first landing, he was landed high and dry. And the second landing was for the newsreels, where he waded in, in rank with General Wainwright at his right and rear. Second footnote. Uh, uh, Charlie uh, Smith was uh, uh, killed on a lady. <coughs> And uh, Bob Kardash on um, Okinawa. And one of the most uh, shocking things that ever happened was when I was in Hawaii and had mailed a, a letter to Bob, and uh, it came back marked missing in action. I have always kept that letter. And it was, as I say, one of the terrible things that I had to face someplace along the way. Bob's email, V-mail, we didn't have email back in those days. But that, that really just hit me so hard. You know, all the guys that had been killed around me were uh, good friends and uh, and it was difficult, but uh, uh, for Bob and Charlie being such talented people uh, to have been killed, I really uh, still bothers me. Um, I have a, a map I prepared some time ago. This, this shows all of my travels in the Pacific. There were certainly a lot of different places that I had visited. Some years ago, my kids were after me to um, write about my wartime experiences. They always claimed I never talked about them. And so uh, I, I finally set about doing it. That's uh, the basis of my book here. But I ended my little discussion uh, by saying something uh, to the effect that I was probably evacuated under conditions uh, that other guys weren't. And I don't know why, and I never questioned it. And uh, why it happened, I, I can't say, but I, I managed to get out from all of that. But from time to time, I say to myself, uh, why Charlie? Uh, why Bob? Why not me? So those are my war experiences.
Well, sir, uh, we thank you very much for sharing those with us. Um, is there anything else you, you would like to add before we close here, or do you think you summed it all up there? I think I've uh, summed it up. I've survived, and um, one of the pictures I put in my book